welcome to The Rich Report, a podcast with news and information on high-performance computing. Today, my guest is from Violin Memory. We have Jonathan Goldick. Jonathan is the CTO of software for the company. So, Jonathan, welcome to the show. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate you having me. Well, hey, Jonathan, I'm glad we could talk. That's coming up on the holidays here. But uh, why don't we start with your slides, and we'll follow that uh, with a Q&A. Okay, so uh, thank you. And uh, here to talk about violent memory and what we bring to the high-performance computing world. And uh, so let's just jump right into it. So we're on slide two. So generally the way Violin and a lot of other big companies see the world is we've really evolved the data center into having very high speed multi-core computing. And we're working towards you know, very high speed, low latency networking. You know, the HPC world has been there for a while, but you know, the enterprise data centers are getting there with things like the Juniper Q fabric and you know, products from Cisco. But storage has really lagged. And we've done great work getting, you know, storage capacity onto better than Moore's law, really. But storage performance, random I.O., low latency, that's really lagged for many years. In fact, it's been getting worse. You know, the, as the capacity per spindle goes up, you know, the actual performance per terabyte has been going down. So that's really where we see violin solving a major problem, is getting high-speed, low-latency, solid-state storage and making it ready for the enterprise and really high-performance apps. The goal here is to get storage performance on Moore's Law. So otherwise, you have this really high performance compute, great networking, and then, you know, as Larry Ellison says, you, know, the, you, know, you have the turtle. You have the really slow storage, and that blocks the performance of everything else. So the goal really is to match, you know, using flash technology, matching the storage performance to the compute in the network, and do it at a cost that people can manage. So let's talk about the Violin 6000 so this is something that we have launched at Oracle World a few months back, and it's really designed to be extremely high availability, in fact, not just high availability, but fault tolerant, but extremely high performance. So if you look at this system, everything is redundant. There are no single points of failure. Everything can, you know, it's really designed to fail in place if components, you know, this is all solid state, but if something were to fail, everything has built-in spares. So there are spare flash capacity, there's spare flash cards, we have multiple RAID controllers, we have multiple you know, network topology. Everything is sort of designed in for a fail-in-place model. So we look at the system, and if you see sort of the bottom you know, right quadrant of the system, these are our intelligent memory cards. Each one of these you can think of as a very high-performance flash you know, module, with really but designed from the flash ships outward. You know, very smart system, intelligent grooming, everything to be high performance. But we also designed the system to have 64 of them so that you can use many of these cards all working together. So we combine that with our, our own RAID technology, which we call VRAID, which is designed to spread load across all the cards and ride through any failures. And additionally, to give very high performance when you're doing the work that Flash needs to do, and there's grooming, there's garbage collection, all these things that you don't want to see in user experience. You want high performance, low latency all of the time, but you want to write, you've got to do this kind of work. So our RAID technology really, and our patents around this, really give the high user performance but doing the work you need to do. And along with the theme of making everything fault tolerant is the four RAID controllers in there. If we were to lose one, there would be no performance impact. If you lose two, you'd still be at 75% of maximum performance. If you lose three, you're still at 50% of maximum performance. The whole goal here is to deliver as close, you know, very, very high performance, very reliable system. And this system, as you're seeing right here, is a million IOPS at a few hundred microseconds. So think about a 3U system that's doing a million IOPS per second. Additionally, what we have in here is, you know, we're pretty agnostic to how you connect storage to servers. You know, we could potentially be network attached through these typical SAM protocols, a fiber channel, iSCSI, and Feniband. But we also know that there are cases where you want to make a direct PCIe connect. So we allow both options. You, know, you can have multiple lanes, you know, eight lanes, I4, a PCIe, Gen 2, 
or you can have QDAR and Finiband, you know, whatever you need to fit into your enterprise. So another thing that's interesting about this system is we have built-in x86 processing power. So there's a dual x86 server inside the system, which while optional, allows you to you know, have the promise of moving applications closer to the data. And right now we're working with a number of vendors to actually get their applications running directly into our system. So there's a whole bunch of options going forward that this system enables. So uh, Island has been the benchmark platform of choice for a number of our partners. We've got the audited records for TPCC and E. In fact, we have three of the top 10 benchmark records. If you look at you know, the HP ProLiant example, um, we've done a number of benchmarks with HP, both with Microsoft SQL Server and with, you know, we've also have Oracle benchmarks. In the last week, probably we've seen the Oracle Cisco dual processor record. This is the latest version of Oracle. You know, we have fantastic performance in million, just over a million TPC. And uh, we also have one of the lowest costs. And it's interesting that the violin system was actually a substantial fraction of all the value in the system. So you know, we appreciate these records with our partners, but we've also done these things with you know, high performance, big data file systems like IBM GPFS. So we have a record where we've done 10 billion file scan in 43 minutes. And that just shows how much our system can accelerate metadata performance in big, really big data file systems, I mean, 10 billion objects. If you look at the previous record that IBM had done, it was more of a research system that was, you could not purchase. With IBM, you know, with IBM and Violin together, it's a super high performance big data file system. So, move along to slide five. So the next area we definitely spend a lot of energy on is Hadoop and other big data platforms that are Hadoop-like. And one of the note things that people see in the Hadoop world is they really design these systems for sequential operations. At least they think everything can be sequential. And that's one of the reasons why people build Hadoop servers out of internal SATA drives. You know, in this picture here, you see sort of a typical Hadoop workflow. Everybody knows about MapReduce, and Map is really very sequential. It's highly sequential read across a lot of data. And in the middle, though, you've got to shuffle the results from the map for the reducers. That middle spot is completely random. And it has to be just because of the nature of giving all these components from lots and lots of mappers to relatively few reducers, where the reducers might be one per core in the cluster. Now, the reducers are sequential I.O. again. I mean, they're sequential reads to sequential writes. But that middle section, that is the performance bottleneck for Hadoop, and really other NoSQL type architectures that fall into the same sort of model. And what we're seeing is that performance bottleneck is the 50 to 80% of all the time you spend is in that middle spot. This is really an important thing because now we're looking at you know, sort of a bifurcation in the analytics space. I mean, the people who are doing real-time analytics, they're really focused on doing all in DRAM. You know, if it can't fit in DRAM, they just throw those records away. You know, for example, like call records and telcos or genomics, you can't do analytics on anything that doesn't, real-time analytics on anything that doesn't fit in DRAM. So then we move to the Hadoop architectures, and this system, it's really batch-oriented. If you have to go into Hadoop, you were looking at maybe hours to do an operation, or at least tens of minutes. But there's a huge gap between the real-time and the batch. And really, that shuffle phase is one of the barriers to making Hadoop architectures get near real-time. This is one of the areas we see Violin is really going to help. So let's talk a little about Violin and big data, some more on the Hadoop architectures. So really, the goal here in Violin is to optimize the compute storage and performance per rack. You know, one of the things we've seen in Hadoop is, say, two years ago, a typical Hadoop node might have had four internal SATA drives. And then two years ago, you know, maybe, or, you know, it was four, and now the next last year, it's more like 12, and this year, it's getting more like 16. And the thing we're seeing, and of course, the servers are getting bigger to you know, fit those drives. And the reason why we're doing this is we really need to get more disk arms on the problem. That random shuffle phase is just costing performance. On the other hand, we're, we've dropped our effective compute per rack because now instead of one use servers, we're at two or three use servers. One of the things we see about this is this is really hurting the effective performance per rack. 
Now Hadoop is very elastic. We can add more racks. You know, instead of 32 servers, we can make 100 or 400 or 500 or even thousands. But most, the typical enterprise customer, what they're looking for is to optimize the performance of a single rack worth of Hadoop without losing the elasticity of Hadoop scale-out architecture. So with Violin, one of the things we're seeing here is you know, we really want to have the ability to optimize the performance of the rack but not lose horizontal scalability. So instead of going shared nothing or shared everything, we want a hybrid approach. The goal here is to have you know, all the elasticity advantage of shared nothing but shared within a rack. Okay. This gives the option of moving Hadoop and these batch time, you know, analytic systems from really from batch model to a real time, or at least near real time. And that gets us off of the limits of having DRAM. You know, the, really, the real time analytics being limited by DRAM is really reducing the options we have as, you know, as, an, as an industry. So when we look at the storage bottleneck, it's really that 50 to 80% of the time doing random I.O. So, and this random I.O. is actually getting worse as the CPU counts go up. You know, as these cores go up, we, we have more and more reducers and therefore more and more random I.O. So this hybrid architecture really applies to both Hadoop and NoSQL. This gets us the ability to use cheap disk and fast flash. You know, the cheap disk for the bulk you know, petabytes of information that you might want to analyze and flash for the random I.O. And this really gives us all the advantages of the efficiency of SATA and the scalability for performance of Flash. So let's move to slide seven. So one of the examples that's typically given is like a terasort example. You know, if you were doing 10 terabytes of, you know, sorting 10 terabytes of data, which is not that much these days, really, if you think about the unreliable SATA, so first you triple the input, and you also know you're going to triple the output. But if you used shared storage, you know, that's enough for the sequential parts, you know, or the unshared storage, really for the sequential parts. But you really need something that's high enough bandwidth to deal with the random I.O., with that shuffle phase. So in the 10 terabyte example, if we had roughly 40 terabytes of flash, which is within the 6,000's capabilities, that highly random I.O. just gets handled by all of the, this really fast flash, very high bandwidth, and really that takes out 50 to 80% of your wall clock time. And this is really for the goal of getting us to near real time on these batch architectures. And that's really going to enable really new advantages in, you know, in analytics, really to do near real time on just vast amounts of data. And we've seen this architecture really applies to really most of the big data architectures. You know, NoSQL like Cassandra and Mongo. There's a number of these databases where this just generally as an architecture applies. So, um, when I open up for questions. Sure. Well, thanks for that, Jonathan. Uh, I'm curious about the hybrid architecture. Is that like a hierarchical kind of storage system? So, we don't think tiering works all that well, generally because tiering's design is to predict the, you know, predict the future from the past. What we think this is you know, really going to be solved is with direct data placement. So, if we update the, you know, the placement algorithms of Hadoop and these NoSQL databases, so that the proper intermediate objects go get placed on flash. You know, this is basically a 50-50 read-write load, which is interesting. That's one of the things that Violin is very good at is high sustained write performance. If you use a typical SSD, they're really read-oriented. But these intermediate objects, like I showed in that Hadoop example, they're write once, read once, but highly random. You know, I just don't see a tiering solution as really solving that. So Jonathan, you know, uh, we hear a lot in MySpace about uh, data intensive computing and Hadoop and big data. Do you see a lot of your growth coming from that space? I think there's a great opportunity there. We've been doing very well in databases, obviously, and virtualization. But all these customers are also looking at, you know, sort of batch analytics now. And so there's a lot of storage to be, you know, a lot of opportunity there in these architectures. I think uh, pretty much everybody's kicking the tires. Some people in the web space have already gone all in, but in the big enterprises, they're really trying to get a single rack's worth of a dupe really sailing along. I'd also say in the NoSQL space, a lot of the enterprises are looking at, you know, picking the right NoSQL model because, you know, Cassandra is different than Mongo, which is different than React. They all have sort of slightly different knobs on the cap theorem. 
So they're really trying to figure out from an application's point of view where they want to set the thresholds. And the advantage of the flash is it really applies to all of them. So Jonathan, we've just seen the uh, firing up of the uh, first flash-based supercomputer, the uh, Gordon system at SDSC. Um, are, are you talking to customers about that kind of solution? So, so we have talked to these vendors. So if you look at the Gordon supercomputer, the I.O. node, where they took the LSI controllers, which is my previous company, uh, and you know, put a whole bunch of SSDs in there to build their own I.O. node, the super I.O. nodes. That is morally equivalent to a 6000. It just doesn't have all the hot swappable and you know, you know, integrated you know, x86 CPU, that all the things that we have, all the network connectivity. You know, we really think that what we produce in the 6000 is what they tried to build, you know, sort of small soldiering. It's definitely an area in where we see that the analytics that are being done in these HPC sites would definitely benefit from the 6000. Well, we're talking to many of them. So Jonathan, kind of a wrap-up question here. Um, you've, you've integrated the processors right on the, uh, the high-speed storage device. Do you foresee a time when uh, maybe application vendors might bundle uh, this kind of solution together with, say, like a, a Hadoop um, um, appliance or maybe an Abacus or a CFD appliance? Absolutely. That's one of the great things about you know, the system is if the application fits within our CPU profile, you can just use the integrated servers, you know, directly hot swappable servers that can run in standard Linux. And if the application requires you know, much more processing power than we can fit internally, you can just directly PCIe cable it to as big a server or a pair of servers as you want. So there's a lot of opportunity and a lot of our partners are software vendors <clears throat> who are trying to make appliances. That, you know, if you look at what Oracle's done to the software only market is while well, you still have to be able to sell software options, a lot of people expect appliances these days. You know, I think violin really, you know, really enables that. All right. Well, Jonathan, I really want to uh, thank you for coming on the show today. Okay. Thank you for having me. Okay, folks, that's it for the Rich Report. Stay tuned for more news and information on high-performance computing.